recording. All right, well, let's go ahead and get started. First of all, I apologize for my voice. I have a head cold. I'm getting over it, so I'm just grateful to have a voice today. And I welcome you to our final lesson in this Exploring the Gospel Bible Study. So thank you so much for joining me on this journey. My home is in heaven. I'm just traveling through this world. The late Billy Graham said that. Of course, he is in heaven. And someday we will join him. And I'm just, I'm appreciative of this quote because sometimes we forget that heaven is our home and not earth. So let's pray and then we'll get started. Father, we praise your holy name and thank you for giving us the gospel message, the message of hope that we need to take to the world. So I thank you for my sisters in Christ who have joined me in this study as we've unpacked the gospel. And I pray that they have been forever changed and renewed by studying your word. So as we finish up this, these lessons, Lord, we ask and pray that you be blessed as we study your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, here we go. Hello and welcome to this final lesson in the Exploring the Gospel Bible Study. And I'm so thrilled that you've been able to join me on this journey as we unpacked the gospel message. In our last lesson, we looked at the hero of God's great story of redemption. And to fully understand the gospel message, we all need to know the consequences of our sinful nature. And that's why we also studied our fallen condition before Jesus. Our Savior Jesus Christ came to deliver us from that sin, but the story doesn't end there, right? He also brings restoration, and that's the last part of the story that everybody needs to hear. Now, remember the five main points of the gospel message. God loves man. Man is separated from God by sin. God's main provision of reconciliation is Jesus. God raised Jesus from the dead to conquer sin. We can have new life in Jesus and be reconciled to God. And that's the message we want to give to the world. Newness of life. If we just tell people about how Jesus died for them and rose from the dead and they can have eternal life, well, we're skipping out on some important information. And that is restoration, the new creation that awaits all who call upon the name of the Lord. And when they are saved, they need to be reminded that they are transformed. They do not remain the same. When we look at creation, we see newness of life all the time. I'm looking out the window and I see my trees, which are completely barren of leaves because of winter. But I know in the spring they will bring forth beautiful leaves again. So we are constantly reminded of who God is <clears throat> when we look at creation. We can learn some attributes of God when we study creation. So God gave us his special revelation, his word, and by reading it, we can learn more about who God is. He communicates to us. So we need to remind people of God's love for them. People need to know that something significant happens to them once they confess with their mouths Jesus as Lord and, believes in their, and believe in their hearts that God raised him from the dead. And that is that transformation. Remember, the demons proclaim Jesus as the Holy Son of God. So it isn't enough to just say it. One must take ownership of the message and possess it. You must admit that Jesus is Lord of your life. And that's when we begin to see transformation happen. Paul wrote, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new, sorry, that's supposed to be the new man has come. The old has passed. The new is here. As Jesus's representatives, we have the privilege of announcing the life changing power of God's coming new creation as well. So we remind people that once you believe in Christ Jesus, you are new. You don't go back to being the old person. It's like if you were sick in the hospital and they performed surgery and they sent you home, 
you wouldn't ask that they return you back to the previous state that you were in before the surgery. No, you would rejoice that you're healed and you're doing better and you want to get better. You wouldn't insist on being sick again before you left the hospital. We all expect to be healed, right? To be new, to be better. It's the same thing with salvation, including the earth. In Revelation, it is said, John wrote, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. Newness of life. Everybody wants it right? Everybody wants something new. God's great story offers that. It offers answers to those life questions that many callers into the Billy Graham Evangelical Association call center ask. What will the world look like when all is as it should be? Who or what will be the focus of our main purpose of this world? These are some more questions that they ask. Because they're being told about God's redeeming love, right? They're being told that only Jesus can solve their problems, but they want to know more. They say, okay, I want to know what that new life and new world will look like. They want to dream about their new purpose once they have Jesus. And that's perfectly understandable, right? We, re- we learned last time about our Redeemer. The new creation is being restored through the work of the Redeemer, Jesus. Remember, we all owe a debt. Our sin earns death. We have the wrath of God resting on us before Jesus. So after Jesus, we are redeemed. He pays that ransom. He took the punishment that we deserved. He took that punishment for us. And now we have his righteousness placed on us as he took our punishment upon himself. So when he died and rose from the dead, we were given newness of life for those who call upon the name of Jesus. And Jesus himself announced this good news. After John the Baptist was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, what? Proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe. Repent and believe the good news. So the kingdom of God is a present reality. We must be born again. And the spirit of Jesus, the spirit of God that comes upon us, breathed upon us by Christ, is the guarantee, the pledge, the foretaste of what is to come. The kingdom of God. How would you explain it? What is the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven, right? Remember what Jesus prayed for before he was crucified. He prayed that his disciples would be as one as he and the father are one. And then he prayed for us future believers. And he prayed that we would be one with the father as Jesus is one with the father. So that is heaven. That is the kingdom of God on earth that we are one with the father through Christ Jesus that we would take that message, that we would do the will of the Father as Jesus did while he was on earth. Remember, he only lived to do the will of the Father. The discipleship coaches talk to with people who are at the very end of their ropes. And it's heartbreaking. It really is. Oops, pulled up the wrong lesson. <laughs> So they are very at the very end of their ropes. They have tried everything. They call into the center and they say, look, I've tried religion. I've tried to look deep within myself. You know, I've tried drugs, alcohol. Nothing has solved their problems. All things have made, all these things that they've tried have even made their problems worse. But the online guests contact the callers Because they're searching for something. They're searching for wholeness. They just can't get this wholeness from the world. They are so lost and confused. And one caller even said, look, I don't even believe in God, but will you pray for me? 
and the discipleship was just, coach was just floored by that. The world needs Jesus. That's the only answer. They're always looking for solutions, right? Even me at work, I'm always looking for solutions to the problems that I encounter all day. The world is seeking solutions for the problems. But they are finding out that only Jesus can give them that newness of life that they're looking for. In 1 John 2, we are told the world and its desires are what? Passing away. But whoever does the will of God lives forever. So the world and its desires are dying. So it would make sense then to look to the world for solutions because those solutions would only be temporary because the world is temporary. God clearly states in his word that this natural world and everything in it is passing away. And remember, we looked at the laws of physics, entropy. The laws of physics tell us the same thing. Nothing in this world can stop it from passing away. So then why would we look to the world for a solution, a permanent solution to our problems? It makes no sense to look to a person, right? Because a person has problems too. And that person is here only temporary. It makes no sense to look to world leaders or laws because all of that is passing away. So we can't look to climate change initiatives to stop all the problems in the world or global taxes to stop climate change. Not any one act of Congress can change the world. Not NATO, not the UN, no world leader can stop it. The world and its desires pass away. But whoever does the will of God lives forever. Only that which exists out this natural world can stop what's wrong with the world. And that's Jesus. This present world and its desires and pleasures are fleeting. But we are told the love of God and his good plans for our lives will last forever. And that's the message that people need to hear. Once they make Jesus as Lord to their lives, does it mean that poof, all their problems disappear and they'll never have any problems anymore? No. It means they found the solution to what ails them, looking to Jesus for those answers. Once Jesus conquered death, unlike any great man or leader has ever done, no great leader has ever done that. He proved to his own people that he is their Messiah that was promised in the Old Testament. And once he ascended to the throne, he proved that he is Lord over everything. He told them in Matthew 28, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. I am going to send you what my father has promised. Stay until you've been clothed with the power from on high. So Jesus knew that his men he was leaving behind, his apostles, would need power. A power that comes from God, not the world. Jesus was given all power and authority to make us new again. What has been broken, he can restore. Praise God today, because if you have been restored, then you are a broken vessel mended by God that he can now use. That's the beautiful message that the world needs to hear, because all of us are broken. What a powerful and loving God we serve. He did not have to do this. He could have just created and said, okay, see ya. You guys are all on your own. Good luck. But he didn't do that. He provided a way. He provided a new creation. In the Bible, it says that Jesus was a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. And I can just imagine that because when he walked in the Garden of Eden, it was perfect. It was a perfect environment. And now when he walked in Nazareth and Galilee and all through Jerusalem, he saw the effects of sin on his perfect creation. He must have been sorrowful. When God walked the earth, it was paradise. But when Jesus walked the earth, it was tainted by sin. Just imagine the sight. 
But God isn't finished with his story. Remember, in Revelation, we're told, Behold, I am making all things new. And we all love newness, don't we? (laughs) Sitting in a new car, that new car smell, going out and buying new clothes as opposed to going to Goodwill, (laughs) right? New furniture, a new home. We all want new. But one thing we also want is a purpose. We see that even here at work. Find your purpose, right? We're telling our students. Everybody wants purpose. That's something that we believers in Christ and the non-believers have in common. Everybody wants to have meaning and purpose to their life. And a lot of the people who call into the Billy Graham Association are asking that. Life as new creations in Christ should be the most exciting and wonderful life anyone can imagine. Right now we have purpose, right? To be a wife or a mom or sister or an aunt or uncle, right? We have a purpose at our jobs to do something. We want to feel meaning and we have meaning, but some days more than others, right? And we desire that perfect environment. But when we get to heaven, we will have perfect management. Right now we're all managed by imperfect managers. So sometimes we get upset when they do something wrong. And my son was asking, when we get, when you all get to heaven, this heaven that you believe in, what will you all do all day? Just sit around? Because everybody wants purpose. They want to have something to do. What he doesn't understand is when we get to heaven, we will have a new perfect purpose. We will have perfect meaning. We will be in that perfect environment. And our management will be perfect. We will have a perfect job. And we will see perfect results. That's something we don't see here on earth, right? We have imperfect management, an imperfect job, and we don't put through perfect results, do we? But in heaven, all that will change and it will be perfect. We can't possibly imagine that now, but when we get there, we will see. We will have things to do, but our managers, our bosses over us will be perfect. And so we will have that meaning that we've craved all our lives. Those in Christ can rely on a new creation that is perfect forever. Isn't that the message of hope that everybody in the world wants to hear? They are so desperate, desperate to find belonging, to find that tribe that they can belong to, to be accepted, right? For who they are. We hear that all the time. But yet in the back of their minds, they know that everything in this world isn't satisfying to them. You know, the new house ends up getting old and has cracks in the ceiling after a while, right? The new car, well, eventually runs down and you have to get it repaired. Our bodies, for crying out loud, (laughs) are starting to break down, right? So we start to crave that newness that will last forever. We have that message. But the world right now in their current state, we can't be angry with them. When we see the people marching and they're saying horrible things and they're wanting Christians to be punished and taken to court and their businesses shut down, we tend to get angry and and frustrated by that. But we can't because of what Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So they are walking around blind. They need to see that light, but they keep believing in the God of this world. Who is that? Who is the God of this world? That's right. The devil, just like Eve bought into his lies, people are still buying into those lies today. If you just do this, then you'll have happiness. If you just buy that, you'll have happiness. If you just work here, you'll have happiness. If you have this degree, you'll have happiness. If you get married or don't get married, if you change your gender, if you don't change your gender, I mean... They're being told all these messages by the God of this world, but he has blinded their minds to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel. So if you have that light right now, if your eyes are opened and you've understood every single part of this message that I've given you, then praise God, because you do have the light. You do have the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Your eyes have been opened. 
So if you are feeling frustrated about the people in this world who are blinded, ask God to forgive you and to give you his eyes to see them with compassion as he did. Remember, as we learned in Matthew 9, when he saw the multitudes coming toward him, he had compassion because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And Jesus was the good shepherd, remember? His heart went out to all these people coming toward him for healing, desperation. They were filled with desperation, but he had compassion for them. He didn't say, oh, look at these awful people. Oh, my goodness, get them away from me. No, he had compassion as a shepherd who loves the sheep. That's how we are to be, having compassion for the people of this world who are asking these questions. Who am I? Why do I matter? Why am I even here? They long for newness of life. So if we have that message, we must take it to the world. Workers at the Billy Graham Association Call Center get many online guests who reveal their hearts by saying, if only I had this, if only I had that, then I would be happy. They say, if only I had a relationship, if only I had a job, If only I had a college degree, a house, a family, a friend, then I would be happy. So the callers come in and they're they're asking, they're saying these things and the people listening to them see what's deep inside their heart. If they're longing for a relationship, they know they need Jesus. If they're longing for a job, they know they're longing for a purpose in this world, right? They're longing for that college degree. They're looking for that identity to be able to say, look at me. This is what I did. A house. They're looking for a home, right? A family. They're looking for belonging. A friend. They are desperately searching. But only God can give us the newness of life and the joy we are searching for. And that's what the callers need to hear. And that's what the discipleship coaches tell them. People in this world are seeking for solutions, remember? They want to know how to solve the problem of what went wrong with the world. And how would God's great story answer that question? What went wrong with the world? Who or what will rescue me and redeem what is broken? That's what they ask when they call in. They know they're broken and they're searching for wholeness, remember? So who or what is going to help me? Jesus. Now, during the conference, we were given some uh, examples of the callers who called in, and then we were given the names of Jesus to use to answer these callers. So it was just like a practice test for us, an exercise to see how we would do it. So these are just some of the names of Jesus. One thing we learned was how to reflect on those names as a person tells you what he or she needs in their lives. And these are just some of the names, Prince of Peace, Great Physician, Savior, Deliverer, Light of the World, Redeemer, and Friend. So in the lesson, I gave you some examples of this. So when we see these names of Jesus, for us, our eyes are open. So these names give us peace. But to the people who don't know Jesus, they need to know. So think about it. If someone came to you and said, my father is dying of COVID and I can't go visit him in the hospital. Help me. I feel so sad. I I lack control. I feel like my life is just completely out of control. What are some of the names that you could tell them? Are they searching for the great physician and healer? Maybe they are looking for peace, the prince of peace. And so you could reflect on those names and those verses and tell this person, hey, I want to introduce you to the Prince of Peace because it looks like you're looking for peace. Or I want to tell you about the great physician who heals us, not just physically, but spiritually. Or maybe you have a friend who comes to you and says, I want to stop drinking, but I just can't. I've attended those meetings, but still drink. Can you help me? Maybe this person needs to know about Jesus, their Savior. Or Jesus, the deliverer, who can deliver us from all of these addictions, right? Who can deliver us from all those strongholds and tear down those strongholds that we built up? These are ways that you can answer these questions. Say, hey, 
let me tell you about the one who saved me. I was once deep in darkness too. I thought I could attend, I thought I could attend some meetings and be released, but you know what? It didn't happen. Let me tell you about the great deliverer who delivered me out of darkness. These are just ways that you can introduce Jesus into the conversation. If a friend comes to you with some issues that he or she is dealing with, that's what we learned when I attended that conference. And it made so much sense to me. The name of Jesus is power. And by just showing people who Jesus is and where he's found in the scriptures, you are helping them. By taking people to these names and showing them where he is in scripture, we can show how Jesus meets their needs right where they are. They don't need to change or, you know, become this person before Jesus. No. When he saw the multitudes coming toward him, he didn't insist that they all go get cleaned up. No. Jesus met them right where they were because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So when you might want to share your own story too, you can say, hey, I've been there. I remember when this happened to me. Let me share with you my story of hope and redemption. And then you can show them how God restored you. That's the hope that they need to know. So definitely share your story with them. The gospel message, ladies. We just went through four lessons that unpacked the gospel. It's the message of how Jesus died for us because we were sinners and we were separated from God who loves us so much that he sent his son to die for us. And he rose again and defeated death, paid our you know, ransom. He took the punishment that we deserved and then exchanged it with his righteousness. That's the story that people in this world need to hear. It gives them joy and peace and abounding hope that nothing else in this world can give them. Hope. Once we know this message, we must share it. When we spread truth, we sow those seeds of hope, remember? And we are his image bearers. And as image bearers, God made us for our relationship with him as his children. This is what sets us apart from the plants and the mountains and the trees and all the animals. God made us co-rulers of his creation. Once you tell someone who is so desperate for meaning and purpose, this fact, oh, you'll just see how it gives them that calm and peace. Everybody on earth is searching for a purpose, for meaning in their life. That's something that we have in common with unbelievers. We want to have that sense of purpose in this world. So remember, take them down Romans Road. Romans 1 reminds them that they are sinners separated by God, separated by sin from God. And then in Romans 3, they're told that no one is good. No one can be good enough, that no one seeks after God. But in Romans 6, they're told, but the free gift of God is eternal life. And in Romans 10, they're told if they just confess with their mouths Jesus as Lord and believe in their hearts that he rose from the dead, they will be saved. And Romans 11 and 12 go on to tell them about that personal relationship they can have with Christ Jesus. The power of the gospel, ladies, that's what we've just spent four weeks learning. And I thank you for joining me on this journey of the gospel message. Go and tell the people God brings to you about their need of a savior. Christ the Lord. He is the only source of hope for all the things wrong in this world. So until next time, I thank you so much for joining me again on another study. And next time, next week, we will start a new study, a study that some of you have made done, but it will be new to some of you. And it's the seven I am sayings of Jesus. It's called Knowing Christ. And it's based off a book by Dr. R.C. Sproul. And it's one of my favorites. I love teaching it because we go through the book of John, the gospel of John. So after learning about this, about who Jesus is and what he did, it's going to be great now to study the seven I am sayings of Jesus. And that starts next Thursday. You're welcome, ladies. Thank you so much for joining me. I, I just love seeing your names as they pop up and know that God has you here for a reason. So. 
Thank you for joining. So let's pray, and then we'll be on about our days. Father, Lord, thank you, Jesus, for the gospel message, that message of hope that so many of us are craving. We are searching for it, and you gave it to us, Lord. Thank you. I thank you for each lady who has joined me on this journey, Lord, that you bless her with every spiritual blessing for wanting to learn more about you. And we pray for each of their needs, Lord. We lift up Janine's mom and pray that you bring a Christian nurse or a Christian doctor into her room to share with her the gospel message so that her mom can be transformed, not just the outer healing, but the inward healing. And she can know you and have newness of life, Lord. That's our prayer. So we pray for healing for Janine's mom, but also for salvation. We pray for that for all of those in our family who don't know you, Lord. We pray that their eyes would be open today. Help us to be light shining in their dark world and cause them to ask us, hey, why are, you, why are you always smiling? Why are you always so cheerful, even when things are going wrong? What's the answer for all the problems that you have in your life? Why are you always so happy? And I pray that each one of these ladies will have the answer and point them to Jesus. Thank you, Father, for being able to teach these Bible studies, for us having a job where we can take time out of our busy days to seek you. And we give you all glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, ladies. Be blessed. And I will see you next week. You're welcome. Thank you. Bye.